So now we're going to talk about sort of the structure of a story and also the heart of a story. And if you turn to page six, what is a lead? Now, if you get overwhelmed, don't worry, because we're recording this, and you can watch it again, and you can take this home and study it. Um, but this is any good journalism class is going to talk to you about what is a lead. So the lead is the hook, or the initial sentence, paragraph, or anecdotes at the beginning of a story. This is what is supposed to draw in the reader, capture their interest, and communicate the relevancy of the story. It should set the tone. It should give the reader a good idea of what type of ministries the story is going to contain. Um, and once you have your lead, you really can't write your story until you have your lead. It's a little different than essay writing that way. Because I like when, for essay writing, I like to write the body and then go back and write the introduction to what I've just written. But with a lead, you really need to find the heart of the story before you can write the story. Um, so we'll talk about gathering all that information later. But I just want you to understand what a lead is. So the spiritual heart of things. Since we are writing about what the Lord has done, and I'm on page six in your little handouts. Since we are writing about what the Lord has done, either in an individual life, in a church, in a country, in an outreach, we want to let the reader know early on where the story is going. So the lead needs to be clear, and it needs to have that spiritual heart. It doesn't mean you can't be creative. It doesn't mean that you can't use really interesting descriptors or start from an interesting angle or use metaphors or anything. You can do all those things, but you must keep the tone spiritually focused. That's why you're not going to see references to secular songs or trendy angles or anything that would almost cheapen the story because it's about what the Lord is doing. And you're going to, it's a little different from secular journalism in that way. The lead really, it, it also needs to be compelling because we are talking about the Lord changing lives and saving people and intervening and rescuing orphans. And so the Lord's passion, not just the writer's passion, but the Lord's passion needs to come through that lead. And why is this such an amazing story? Why is this such an eternally important human story? That needs to come through in the lead. It shouldn't be buried somewhere down in the fifth paragraph, right? Um, clarity. Any kind of writing, of course, you need to be clear from the very beginning so that you don't lose your reader immediately. You never want to just lose your reader right away. You don't want to lose them ever, but you really don't want to lose them from the beginning. So you need to give the reader their footing a sense of who, what, and where early in this story. Think of it as the first scene in a movie. And a lot of times with screenwriting, they'll just give you the little, what's it called, Elena, the little words across the screen, like Venice, 1973. Oh, superimposed titles. Superimposed titles. They'll just tell you, this is where we are. This is what year it is. You know, um, or, if, or if they don't do that, they really quickly establish, oh, this is like suburban America. Oh, this is Paris. Oh, this is whatever, right? So you have to give your reader their footing so they can continue walking with you through the story. So uh, we do want to grab the reader and pull them in, but we don't want to confuse them and lose them. And that's why we need a nut graph. That's a funny word, right? Nut graph. But just think about in a nutshell. That's what, where that came from. A nut graph usually follows the lead, or it may even be part of the lead, that summarizes the story basics. It tells you where, who, what, and why of the story. And it's, it's a very busy little paragraph. It has to be super short, and it has to do a big job. So an example, um, after this lead, we drew the reader in with this um, anecdote about a 19-year-old Mayan guy. And then in the third or fourth paragraph, we said, Calvary Chapel Merida, located in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, has been reaching out to rural villages like Tabi for the past three years. Now you know where we are, you know what church is doing it, you know what they're trying to do, how long they've been doing it, and you see this is less than like 30 words. You packed all of that in, and that's journalistic writing. Journalistic writing, we're going to talk about this in another class, you have to write really tight. It's not like, oh, there's a ministry, and it's in Mexico, and their heart is for the Mayan people, and so for the last three... You No, you have to pack it in, and you have to give the reader who, what, when, where, why in like one sentence or one short paragraph. And once you get used to doing the nut graph, it's almost kind of fun to see 
how few words can I <laughs> give all this information? Um, and some of us are a little bit of an editing nerd, and we like to cut all the words out that we don't need. And you guys are going to do that in this class later. So you have to give this to your readers so they understand what's going on. If they don't understand what's going on, they're going to get lost. All right, so if you look at issue 75, page 42, you're going to see the chaplain story. Yes, sir. Now, the nut grab is always in the lead. It's either right there in the middle of the lead or it's the next paragraph after the lead. Okay. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit more about what a lead looks like because there's different kinds. Um, so we'll look at that on the next page. But I wanted to show you how you can give the reader their footing really quickly. I'm in the wrong issue, sorry. So issue 75, page 42. Chaplin story. We've already looked at it once. So, so here we have like the main headline of the story. And then we have this, this bold little paragraph here. This is called a subhead. And there's actually two different things that are called subheads, but this is one of them. It's this bold paragraph that comes right at the beginning, and it's just to give the reader, boom, this is where you are. This is what the story is about. Gotcha. So in this case, we made the subhead the nut graph, because we said, well, the reason you would read this is because who, what, when, where, why. This is about chaplain ministry, people reaching out to the herding. Um, these are trained by Billy Graham. So we just said, Hundreds of Calvary Chapel believers have been trained as chaplains by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association and are deployed to minister to the herding when disaster strikes. That's a lot of information in one sentence, right? As catastrophic events continue to increase worldwide, more men and women are needed to share the comfort of Christ, say leaders. That's a very much, this is the stakes. This is why this is important. This is why you need to read this article. And this is what it's going to be about. So we've crammed all of that information. It's like a little teaser, you know, like right. a movie teaser. It's like a little teaser. It's like, this is what you're going to get. And that so was. hopefully that will pull people in to read the piece, yeah. right? Um, but you don't do every story that way. And we're going to look at how every story is different. But that's, that little paragraph is doing a big job. It's a subhead. It's introducing. And then it's also summarizing everything into a nut graph. Now, sometimes writers think, well, at the beginning of the story, you should start at the beginning of the story, right? You should go back and say, when did the chaplain ministry begin, and when, who founded it, and why did they found it? And that stuff is important, but it's only, it doesn't need to be the, the literal beginning of the piece, because it's kind of dry. And what needs to be the beginning of the piece is something like this, page 42. Pastor Frankie Polito of C.C. Vineland, New Jersey, stood beside a victim's family at Ground Zero in 2001, a small wooden urn in his hands. Their faces were streaked with tears. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you feel what's going on? Absolutely. Frank prayed silently, asking the Holy Spirit to guide his words. Then he prayed to the Father aloud, asking comfort for the family. He placed the urn, filled with dust from the fallen Twin Towers, into their hands. They thanked him and walked quietly away into the streets of New York. A few minutes later, another family came forward. You're right there. You're right there in the scene. You can feel the emotional intensity. You can feel, you can see why this is such an important ministry for this man to be there and be praying with people and giving them the ashes and not just, not just someone who doesn't care. Here's your ashes next. Here's your ashes next. But that there's an actual ministry. The family's going on. And then we get a quote because you always want to have these voices coming in as soon as possible. Families wanted closure, so we did the best we could for them. So that's the heart of this chaplain, is he's just wanting to minister to these families. He knows they're hurting. He knows they need closure. They, it was a horrible thing. So it just pulls you right in, just pulls you right into the story. And the lead continues. They saw the need for counseling, uh, ground zero. And then it transitions into um, page 43. Pastor Frank is one of hundreds of Calvary Chapel believers who have been trained as Billy Graham Rapid Response Team chaplains. So now it's connecting you from that little story, that little anecdote at the beginning of Ground Zero into, well, here's the big picture of what's going on. Like, this is happening all over the world, and this is what this ministry is all about, and da 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 And so, but that little anecdote with the scene at Ground Zero and the urns, that's your lead. And that, we, we thought, what is going to pull people in? And really, this was such a powerful story. There are so many things that could have been the lead for this piece. So we kind of had our pick of what we wanted but sometimes the lead is going to be one moment or one thing. We'll talk more about that. But OK, so the history. So we really didn't want to talk at the very beginning about, you know, back in 2001, the Billy Graham Association started a chaplain ministry. 
We saved that for like the fourth paragraph after we'd already pulled the reader in and given them a snapshot of why this ministry exists. And now we give them the backstory. Well, they started it in 2001, they go all over the world, they're deployed by Billy Graham, we give them the facts of, the, the basic facts of it. So in most of our stories, we do include a brief story about how or why the ministry began. However, be careful not to become deterred telling the history instead of the current work that God is doing. Generally, we only have a paragraph or two about the history unless a more detailed history is relevant or foundational to understanding what's happening now. Really amazing. <laughs> what God did then is so amazing that it must be told even now. All right, flip over to page seven. We're going to talk about four types of leads. Um, so what I just shared with you was a narrative lead. And narrative just means like a narrator is telling a story. So when you hear the word narrative lead, don't be intimidated. It's just a personal anecdote of some, some real moment with a real person. So we have found that some of the most powerful leads are those that start with a real story of how God touched a specific person or family. It starts with that changed life. It tells exactly how it happened, just like a novel. A lot of novels are written in third person like that. Maybe they'll give us a little bit of the thoughts in that person's head. They're describing the surroundings. They're describing the person had tears coming down their face. They're, they're very descriptive, but they're trying to pull the reader in, almost like into a movie, into that scene right there. And to not just see the outside, but to realize the emotions that are going on, the spiritual need that's happening right there. But as you're interviewing and as you're listening and you're researching, you're always looking for what is that defining moment? It could be when someone accepts Christ. It could be that person's crisis point or their low point, which later leads them to Christ. It could be an epiphany or realization that they had about God or life. Um, it could be the moment they wake up surrounded by wildfires. It could be you know, some other poignant moment to draw the reader in. So you're listening, listening for that poignant moment. And this is kind of a fun part of this kind of lead. Get inside the subject's head. And, and we'll talk about how you do that, how you figure that out while you're interviewing. But you are trying to describe not only the external, but the internal. Because this is a spiritual story. It's about spiritual things that are happening. And people who have written for newspapers, they don't get to do this. So it's really hard for them to transition over to this more narrative, personal, human kind of storytelling. And so you want to describe the surroundings so that the reader can see where they are, but then you're also describing that person's emotions, thoughts, attitudes, actions, struggles, right? So just as in a good film or a story, character development is huge. It's that inner dialogue, it's that description that helps the reader understand or connect with that person, um, to care about that person. Showing what the person is going through in that moment and how God came in and spoke into their pain or their confusion, or their hopelessness. And we'll talk more about that in showing versus telling, but it's really exciting. Um, accuracy and creative license. Everyone asks me this, so I just thought I would tell you. Every single story in the magazine must be true and accurately told with no exaggerations or false facts. We have a huge responsibility that every single article is airtight, it can stand up to scrutiny, it's, it's full of integrity, it's sincere. So know that. But that said, you can have freedom to use your imagination to create that picture for the reader, right? And so, uh, for example, you might be interviewing someone and they say, then she asked me if God loved her even though she had sinned a lot. So if you want to bring that into, here we are, we're right in that moment, this is what the person said, this is what this person said, you can sort of tweak that a little to make it a quote and say, the girl asked, does God still love me even though I have sinned so much? The same. It's, you're just putting it into right. a quote. You're not going any farther than that because that's all they said. You don't want to embellish anything, but you can do that. So there's a little bit of freedom as we're telling this story in the narrative lead. Um, that's the only time that you can really <laughs> create a quote from somebody else's book. Um, all right, so a good example of a narrative lead, go ahead and read that on the bottom of page seven, deep in the jungles. So this lead really brings you inside the head of who? The 19-year-old mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what do you guys feel like this lead accomplishes? Does it accomplish anything? Is it helpful? Is it powerful? What? Absolutely. Because it's, it's, it's stating what his state of mind was emotionally, mm -hmm. the, the, the inner thoughts in his head, mm -hmm. 
in relation to the history of his heritage and so forth and so on. So it definitely gives you an emotional connection mm -hmm. to what he was feeling mm -hmm. at that moment. Yeah, because how do any of us know what a 19-year-old Mayan who lives in a village <laughs> thinks? Right. What are they dealing with, right? right? And what is he contemplating? Suicide. 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 So yeah. immediately you know this is a life or death situation yeah. here. And then you see the Christians coming, yeah. right? And then you start to cheer. <laughs> you know, yes. So how soon do you know where we are? How soon do you know what country we're in? Oh, immediately. Well, immediately. 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 And that's helpful for the reader. We're deep in the jungles in the Yucatan Peninsula, right? right? You got to know that immediately. And what details convey the spiritual atmosphere? The extreme human sacrifices. Mm -hmm. What did you say, Barb? The details of the human sacrifices that have been historically, traditional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's spiritually, there's a lot of darkness there. Mm -hmm. What were you going to say, Jonathan? Um, I said, uh, what was I going to say? Because I think I said something like uh, human sacrifice, mm -hmm. uh, dark and fascinating, things like mm -hmm. that, just the descriptive language. Mm -hmm. What is this guy's concept of Jesus right, right now, so far? Is it the very last sentence? Knowing him Knowing closely as a friend. Knowing the Lord personally. Well, these people oh. are going to talk about that, but he had only seen what? Crucifixes. Crucifixes and right. old crumbling buildings. Right. So this is all he knows of Christianity. Right. Yet, right? He has no connection to it. Yeah, so it's really painting that, like you picked up on um, Cortez, like it's really painting where is this kid? Where is he at? What's going on? Like what is his world? What, does he have any hope? You know? Um, Okay, so now flip the page. Yes. Well, yes I was going to say the crucifix kind of connects him with the pictures that he probably had in this in practice that he is familiar with. Mm -hmm. yeah, because mm -hmm. it's death. So mm -hmm. he probably. Right. Yeah, and they're kind of crumbling and they're old and there's no power in that. So flip to the next page. Now, this is, and some of you will find this helpful depending on how you learn. This is a bad example of a for the same story. <laughs> so you guys read this, and, and you'll probably be able to tell me why this is a bad example. So the first lead that we looked at it was about um, believers reaching out to these Mayan villagers, but it started with a 19-year-old Mayan young man who was contemplating suicide because that's all he knew to do to change his future and change his standing and uh, his his outlook is very dark and so that's what it starts with and the second lead it's talking about this team of missionaries bumping along the dirt road in a truck and they're bringing flour and all this stuff to the tribe and they're going to make bread for them and hopefully explain that Jesus is the bread of life and now we're going to talk about it all right so what do you guys see what does this lead accomplish or not accomplish well first thing that comes to my attention is they're, just, they're being descriptive but of things that are not important. Uh, flour, salt, oil, and then speaking about uh, the actual team members instead of actually who are they coming to provide? Why are you there to provide in the first place? It's not telling the actual story. Yes. It's not grasping you. On the nose. It's a huge tendency We'll look at the other questions too, but it's a huge tendency with short-term mission trip stories because when you interview the team members, what do they talk about? Oh, the road was so bumpy and we're <laughs> going bouncing all over the place. And you, you know, you have to sift through some of that and try to hurry that part of the interview up, but that is not whose heart for this story. Right. It's not God's heart Absolutely. for this story. I'm sorry the road was bumpy. That has nothing to do with Jesus' heart for these Mayan people. Right. And there's so much deeper of a story here that God is trying to save lives and he did mm -hmm. actually because that young man who was suicidal and never heard the gospel ended up getting saved his whole life changed in the life of his family in the life of his village that is the heart of the story and not bumping along on a dirt road right mm -hmm. and it's not bad you know they're, what they're doing is great they're going and they're going to make bread and that's wonderful but it's not the lead right it's not the heart it's not the most important part of the story. Right. So you start to sort of differentiate. You've got to find that heartbeat of the story. Um, Glory, what were you going to say? Oh, I, I felt like this is more descriptive, like a novel. Mm -hmm. We go on and on mm -hmm. the whole uh, part of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's obviously not getting to the point. And um, I felt like, um, so there's, when you communicate, right, there's a receiver and the, and the sender. And it's just like from 
half of the story. Mm -hmm. You're talking from the sender's part, not from the receiver's part. Yeah. So the receiver is missing. Yeah, too much focus on the American team. Too yeah. much focus on the American team's yeah. experience. And mm -hmm. it's not, that's not the heartbeat. And like she said, it's what about the people? <laughs> what about the villagers? What are the people they're trying to reach? And it's, it's a really common error in a short-term mission story like this to talk about the team. And I'll tell you something that they all say, I went to minister to the Mayan people, but they ministered to me. That's great, it's not going in the story. Right. <laughs> right, I'm glad you had that experience, wonderful, but it's not the heartbeat of the story. You know, and we do know that people get changed by short-term missions trips, but if that's what you write about, then that's what you're Present. gonna write about every single story. What important, really basic information is missing? Where? Where are we? Where? The focus. Yeah, where is Toby? Mm -hmm. Like, if you don't tell your reader that immediately, they're still trying to figure that out. And so they can't even really listen to you because they're distracted. And so you really have to, it's an easy thing to correct, but you really have to get where are we? Right there, first thing. And we don't have enough room. If we were writing an entire book, maybe we could write like this. But we are writing an article, and we have a 1,000 words or 2,000 words. We've got to get to the point and get on with it. So that's the cap, 1,000 to 2,000 words and all It depends, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why is the first example more effective? Anyone? Convey the spiritual need from my perspective. Mm -hmm. It's saw the spiritual need right away. It's supposed to be just the second example that can show that. Yeah, it conveys the spiritual need. It, it, yeah, exactly. And that's the writer's job. we got to tell people. That's why every time I write a story about another country, I try to find out what is the spiritual climate in that country. It's not going to be like the United States. So what are the struggles? What are the misconceptions about God? What, are, what do they live for? What are their hardships? You know, because if you're going to reach a people group, you have to understand that people group. And if you hopefully are giving someone a passion for the Mayan people, you need to help them understand where are they coming from? What is their, you know, what is, it, what is their spiritual need? A lot of times to show what the Lord is doing, you have to set it up. So you can just say, a lot of people, that this team went, a lot of people got saved, hooray. But if you set it up and you show, well, these people had no hope. Got you. These people, have, they barely have food for their families. Got you. They've, their concept of Christ is a, a crumbling crucifix in the middle of a village 20 miles away. Like, this is where they're at. And then Christ comes into the midst of that. And then his light. And then you see how bright and beautiful that light of Christ was for them. And, and it just... Um, it helps you realize what the Lord is doing and why, why he sent this team there. And when we talk about the, um, the shooting story, I was really careful about what details of the shooting I put in there because we don't just want splashy, shocking, we're not about that. But there were, it was a very terrifying experience for her and we told the details that she felt were important because this is how God spared my life. He spared my life. When, when uh, right when she got shot, she had just lifted her arms up to dance, and so the bullet hit her arm instead of her heart. Mm. And then after she got shot, this guy came out of nowhere, really big, strong guy, picked her up off the ground and put her over his back and ran her to uh, behind a car. <coughs> and, and she's like, that's the second time the Lord saved my life. And then, you know, and it just, so we, we weren't just saying, it was mass hysteria, people were screaming, there's blood everywhere, but we were really, what was God doing? Horrible things are happening, bullets are flying, people are screaming, what does God do? He swoops in, he saves her, he gets her behind her, you know, and she can see that. And she's telling me that and it's encouraging her. And, it, and that's not, you're not going to hear that story on secular news. Oh, God rescued this person this way. And so, yes, we're trying to hit that spiritual heart, we're making that spiritual connection. What is the Lord doing? How did he do it? Right? It's a good question. All right, so that's... That's probably our favorite kind of lead here at the magazine because it's so effective and it pulls people in. But it's not always possible. Sometimes you can't interview the person uh, in the other country or sometimes um, it's not, that's not really the heart of the story even. Um, were you going to ask a question, Glory? No, I was thinking, uh, so the reader has to imagine and want, we want to direct his imagination to Jesus because when there is a story, people imagine. We want to give details to them that will focus, change, put their focus on not the, uh, you know, like you mentioned, the not the tragedy, way it says, but how the 
background story, which is God moving and mm. these people. Exactly. Like, drawing the imagination in this way. Yeah. Sort of and that's way. where it's going to be very different from secular journalism. Because there is no God in the story, in secular journalism. But God is the star of the story, of every story for the magazine. And, and the thing that's so amazing is, as you do these stories, even in the most horrible circumstances, God is there. I mean, we did a story on human trafficking that was heartbreaking. But then this lady told us how God rescued her. And so it was like, wow, Lord, <laughs> you see this poor child in Cambodia that was sold by her mother eight times and kept running away and then she ends up at a Christian orphanage and gets saved and has a father. She has a heavenly father and now she has this earthly father and mother. You know, just, so yeah, you're, like you said, you're not just painting the horrible or the shocking or the what, but you're setting it up to show Jesus coming in. Which actually that. makes it easier. Yeah. Right? yeah. It actually makes the task yeah. easier at hand. Yeah. And you just have to think that way. That that's how we're that's why we're telling the story. That's how we're telling the story. Okay. So there's another kind of lead and there's a bajillion kinds of leads. I just picked four. So the big picture lead. Sometimes there's not enough room for a narrative lead. Maybe you have 800 words to tell a story. Or finding that powerful personal example isn't possible or it's not the heart of the story. Sometimes the story is about what God has been doing on a broader scale. So you can use metaphors and be creative, just keep the, to the spiritual heart of things and focus on the human standpoint, touching lives. So a big picture lead that we had on an Africa story, issue 26, if you want to read, there's a good example and then the bad example. So go ahead and read both of those. The first example, which is the one we published, spreading like a deathly shadow through South Africa, HIV and AIDS has left thousands of children orphaned or victimized in horrific ways. The Lord Jesus Christ is using his church to rescue many of these innocent children from a cruel, hopeless fate. C.C. Santa Barbara recently opened a Christian family home in South Africa with eight babies and children abandoned or orphaned because of HIV and AIDS. That's the first example. The bad example of the same lead is South Africa is believed to have more people with HIV and AIDS than any other country in the world, more than 5.5 million, 12% of its population. As a result, thousands of children have been orphaned. That's why a Calvary Chapel in Southern California has been bringing the hope of Jesus to these children. Quote, it's our calling as Christians to care for the fatherless. Quote, said Pastor da, da, da. Okay, while this lead has a lot of information, what is it lacking? It's not grabbing the, it's not grabbing you into the story. The first lead sucks you into the story just through the verbiage uh, uh, deathly shadow opposed to the second lead just being informative mm -hmm. just give me more facts yes right it's very sterile right. and right. you're right Cortez it doesn't draw the reader in at all it's just numbers boom 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 mm -hmm. right and you're asking the reader to process a whole lot and and the, the first one has that what is this spreading like a deathly shadow is that a, that's a metaphor mm -hmm. right you're Please feel free to use those metaphors as they're appropriate. Um, Glory, what were you going to say? Yeah, the first one is giving contrast uh, of what is going on, and it uses the word Lord Jesus, mm -hmm. which is grabbing, and then mm -hmm. it gives hope. Yeah. The second one is kind of complaining, passive, and joy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just as bad, as bad, as bad. What important information does this second? And this is, a, this is a little more of a detailed question, so you have to kind of think about it for a second, but what important information does this bad example leave out? Um, which church it is? Yeah. And the Christian family home. Yeah. It's easy to say, oh, these Christians are helping these poor children. Well, how? Like, just, they're just telling you that they are, or, but to say they have a home there in South Africa and they've already rescued eight children, right. that's huge, right? right. Give me the facts. Do give me the facts. Do tell me what you're doing, um, who you are, where are we? All right. Another big picture lead that had to be a big picture lead because we only had 800 words to write the story. No, we had 600 words to write the story. Uh, hundreds of men have found healing from addictions through Jesus Christ at the U-Turn for Christ ministry in Nairobi, Kenya. Started by Pastor Duncan Muya in 2008 after he was freed from drug addiction at the U-Turn in Paris, California. Now a second U-turn ministry has opened in Kisi, Kenya, under Pastor Randy and Carrie Saul to reach those in Western Kenya. It's not super exciting or <laughs> eloquently written, but it does give you a big picture of we're trying to reach these men stuck in addiction in Western Kenya, and there's 
And as you uh, read that story, and if you want to read it, it's in issue 75, page 49, then it goes into, right away, goes into telling a, a testimony story of somebody. All right, number, uh, page nine, the quote page. Occasionally, every once in a while, you get such a powerful quote that it is enough to pull the reader in and summarize the whole heart of the story in one quote, right? So this story, oh my goodness, was such a powerful story. Issue 25 is a long time ago. Quote, the children's horror always began at night, being abducted from their homes, many of them forced to kill their own family members. Related Pastor Ken Graves, his normally deep, booming voice reduced to a whisper. The burly Calvary Chapel pastor from Bangor, Maine, had traveled to Kitgum, Uganda, to minister to night commuters, African children forced to march miles to sleep in relative safety to avoid kidnapping, torture, and induction into the crazed genocidal cult known as the Lord's Resistance Army. Why was the quote the way to start the story off? I think sometimes, uh, I guess I was taught never um, use a quote when you can't say it better yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I really can't do much better than, than he did, and so might as well just do that. It captures the sense of what's going on. Mm -hmm. okay. And he is really giving you a lot of facts in that quote. I mean, he's not just saying it's a horrible situation down here, but he's telling you what these children are going through. And, um, and it's okay as the writer to say, while he says this, his voice is reduced to a whisper. Because otherwise it almost sounds callous. It almost sounds like, oh, well, this is what's happening. But so that you're also trying to convey that tone, you know, that that this breaks the Lord's heart, that this is happening to these children, and this is unthinkable. This is one of those unthinkable things that's going on. Um, so the person who interviewed this, the person who interviewed this guy has to be mentally aware of this guy's voice being reduced to a yeah. whisper. So there's yeah. some paying attention here. Yeah, and you'll, you'll notice that too as you're interviewing. You'll pick up on where your subject is laughing, where they get really serious, where you can barely hear them because they're starting to cry. Like, and if it's relevant and it's important, you can put that stuff in there. If it's not relevant, we don't always put that stuff in. But um, who or what is the heart of this story? Children. The children. And you see the very, the second word in the, in the quote is children. And we didn't start with Pastor Ken Graves of Cover Chapel, Banger, Maine, went to, we didn't start with that because he's not really the heart of the story. He's kind of more representing the father's heart as he's looking at these children. But the children are the heart of the story. And they're the ones that the Lord wants to go after and rescue. Do you see the who, what, where immediately? Mm -hmm. and, and you already know what the terrible situation the story will be about. So you have a lot of information from this one paragraph and you're immediately drawn in. And the pictures, too, of with this were really drew you in. So there's another quote lead on issue 75, page 22. Now this was a story about a pastor with, uh, who had cancer. And he went through all the things. The, the treatments that, that you go through with that, and he, at the same time, is watching his church dwindle, dwindle, dwindle. And then he has a really hard decision to make, right? So we started with this quote, and it's a thought, which is why it's in italics, but I can't bear to see the church die with me, Pastor Steve Marquez thought sadly. Though he had fought valiantly with kidney cancer for the past three years, Attendance had dwindled dramatically at the Calvary Chapel he had started in Arkansas over 15 years ago. Two sentences. You know the man had cancer. You know his heart is breaking to watch his church dwindle away. You know that we're in Arkansas. You know he started the church 15 years ago. I mean, you are pulled immediately in and you have your footing as the reader. And then it goes on a little bit about how because he was going through these treatments and he got really weak, he couldn't do everything that he normally was doing and it was affecting the church. And, um, and then at the end of the paragraph, um, he was unable to perform his duties. Worse yet, Steve thought, I don't want the remaining congregation to have to watch me die. I mean, 
if you've never been a pastor in this situation, you don't know these are the thoughts that are going through this guy's mind, and his heart is breaking over his church, which is really sweet, because rather than worrying about himself, he's worrying about his people. But it introduced this story of what do these churches do when they're in trouble like this? And then it brought in like how the Lord um, helped him realize he needed to step down, even though that was really hard, but it's for the good of the people, and how the Lord brought another pastor to come, and how there's this ministry that if your church is in trouble or the pastor's in trouble, we'll come, we'll help you so that the church doesn't just fall apart. So, and this was kind of a church feature, but you see we've made it very unique, and you haven't read something like this before. This is because this is what the Lord was doing in that church, and so... Um, that's another quote lead. Yes, sir. Question. How, how do you attain a, 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 a thought as a quote? That's a good question. We'll talk about that with interviewing, but okay. you do things like, what were you thinking mm-hmm. at the time? Mm-hmm. What was going through your mind? When did you realize you were going to have to let go of this? Mm-hmm. 